As a fly fisher, you are always challenged by the conditions you face on the water. The physical conditions on the water will always determine which type of casts you can do and what type of strategies you can apply. It can be that you have a heavy wind coming in from the front or from the side. In those cases, that will be a part of your challenge that day. It might be that you have trees behind you or you're narrowed in your movements. In that case, you have to be able to control that. In this case where I'm standing right now, I have a cliff behind me on the side of me here. And that also represents an obstacle so that I have to work around that in order to achieve my goal, which is to get the fly to the fish. When you read the water, you also have to consider what type of cast will I have to do to get the fly to the fish? Where should I place my cast? Should it be upstream so that the fly can come down? Should it be right on target, sweeping across with speed? All these different factors, you need to take those into account if you want to be a successful fly fisher. To do this, a good technique comes in handy. In this film, we want to show you good and different techniques and strategies on how to fish when you go fly fishing and how to make your fly cast a part of that. When I go fishing, I feel privileged and I want it to be a good experience and my fly casting helps me. So it needs to be easy. It needs to feel good. I don't need to get tired because I want to enjoy my time on the water. As I said, it's a privilege to be out here. And that is what we want to show you in this film. There are some basic physics that we need to understand in order to be able to think fly fishing and fly casting as one unified whole. The first thing I want to tell you a bit about is the line loop. A good understanding of the line loop will help you to know how to cast on the water when you face different conditions. A line loop is formed a bit like this. You have an upper line, you have a line front, and you have a lower line. When it's moving out over the water, it rolls so that the upper line moves forward. This creates like a rolling movement. In terms of line loops, what we're looking for are narrow loops that fly out over the water. The reason for this is that it's very small, meaning that it doesn't take a lot of friction in the air and it's easy for the line to roll out and place the fly on target. What we're not interested in are big loops because big loops are inefficient they have too much air resistance and it's difficult for them to unroll the line and place the fly on target. So we want narrow loops that fly out in a controlled way across the water. Many people talk about adding power to your cast or getting power into the fly line. I think we should be talking about how we get speed into our fly line. Speed is very important because it helps you to cheat gravity for a long period of time. And there are two factors that help you to create speed in your fly cast. One is your acceleration, how you accelerate the rod. You have to remember that when you're fly casting, you come from a position behind you and then you have to go forward. And in this motion, you have to start up slowly and then increase the speed as you move forward. This has to be a smooth acceleration, starting slow, ending fast. The next factor that helps you to create speed in your fly line is the stop you make with the fly rod. So when you accelerate from the position behind you to your front stop, the stop needs to be abrupt. The reason for this is that the rod is bending when you cast it forward. And then when you stop it, it goes like this. The tip of the rod will do like this. This motion is what is creating the speed in your fly line. 
simply that the fly rod counter flexes, we call it, moves a bit down and then straightens up again. That motion creates speed in your fly line. So to have a good uh, stop is actually to make the rod do this motion. If you have a too soft stop, the rod will be too slow to create speed. The line loop is a system of interdependent mechanisms. And the reason why the line on rolls is due to speed, of course, loop size, and friction. Friction is important to understand in terms of how the line distributes speed throughout the line system. The friction of the upper line is the leader and the fly. If you have a long leader and a large fly, it can be difficult to turn over the fly because the friction on the upper line is too high. The friction on the lower line is the friction you have from the line that moves through the guides of the rod. If you have a very high friction on your lower line, it will also affect the speed on the upper line because the line will unroll faster. This means that you will not be able to cast as long distances, but you can control the fly very well and you will always present the fly on a stretched leader. If you have a very low friction on the lower line, you can cast longer distances, but it can be difficult to control the roll of the line. And sometimes uh, you will use all the speed in the system before the fly is turned over, if the friction is very low. So this is important to understand that you have a system of frictions that affect each other in how the line rolls. And you can use this if you want to set up your fly line in a good way. For instance, when I fish in the stream, like here or in a river, I don't have to cast long distances. Then I would like to have a large friction on my lower line, simply because I can get a very good presentation. If I want to go coastline fishing where distance is key, I would like to have a low friction on my lower line so that I can cast further distances. This is how the line loop works in terms of how you choose line systems for different types of fly fishing. What I've just told you about the interdependent mechanisms in a fly cast and how speed is distributed throughout the line can be used when you're fishing. Today I'm casting into a strong headwind and I would like to increase the speed of the line to roll over the fly and present it on a stretched leader. So what I do is I increase the speed by raising the rod. I stop the rod and then I pull the rod back a bit. That will increase the speed of the upper line. Let's take a look at it. So I do my fly cast, come back, release the line and then I raise the rod to create the effect of gaining more speed into the fly line. If on the other hand I want the fly to have time to come down I can slow down the speed of the line by dropping the rod. It looks like this. I do my cast, I stop, and then I drop the rod while I'm shooting the line. Then the fly line will fall down and it will have some time to go down before it starts to come across. In fly fishing we have two types of fly casts. We have an overhead cast and what we call an underhand or a spay cast. The overhead cast is a cast where you have the line flying in the air behind you and in front of you. Whereas the underhand or the spay cast is a cast where you place the leader on the, the water and then you cast from there. When I go fishing I like to use the overhand cast as much as possible. Simply because it's a very effective cast it's easy to make a good presentation and you don't disturb the water. To make a good overhead cast, there are some principles that we need to use. A very important element in all fly cast is when you raise the fly line. Some people, they go fishing and they, have, they hold the rod up here and that creates a loop of line that is hanging. 
So when they try to make the cast from here, it's almost impossible to create the cast and the line will be lying very low in the air. What we need to do is we need to raise the line and that means we take the rod and we put it down so that we are very close to the water surface. From there we have a stretched arm and then we bend the arm and start raising the rod and thereby taking the line off the water. So we raise the line, start slowly and then we accelerate to a stop. By doing this raise and then accelerate to a stop, we create a line loop that flies up in the air, rolls out and then starts to fall. This means that we have a relatively high line lying in our back cast. From there it's easy to make a good forward cast and create a narrow loop because if the line is lying too low the loop will become bigger. So we raise the line, accelerate to a stop. After the stop I follow through with the rod. I reposition the rod from this position to a bit more backwards. I do this so that I get more place to accelerate my cast. We call this pendling or drifting. From this position I then do my forward cast. I accelerate the rod by pushing the butt of the rod into my stomach so to speak and then I create the stop. The reason why I do the pendling or the drift is if I don't do that then the line will be lying in a direction where if I try to make my forward cast I will then make a tailing loop. So it's very important that in the back cast that you reposition your rod, do the pendling or the drift so that you have a good exit point for your forward cast. If we put it together in speed it looks like this. I raise the line, accelerate to stop, drift and then make my forward cast. Let's do that again. I raise the line, accelerate to stop, drift, accelerate forward, stop and let the line go. This is in basic the overhead cast, a very effective cast. When I'm overhead casting I normally don't do any false casts. I strip in the line so that the belly of the fly line is just outside the rod tip and then I raise the line, accelerate, cast and then I let the line go. So I shoot the distance. Just one cast and then I'm back to fishing. There are some situations where it's not possible to do an overhead cast. Simply because you don't have the space. You could have trees behind you, uh, vegetation of some sort, uh, hills, whatever. In these situations it's important that we can do what we call an underhand or a spay cast. Now there are some physics in this that are very important to understand and that will help you to be better at doing these casts. First element that is very important is raising the line. You have to do this really slowly, just like I'm doing right now, really slowly. Because by doing this you keep tension on the rod tip and that is important because what we want to do from this point where we raise the line is that we want to move the line so that the leader lands next to us on the water here. That is our anchor point. That is what will help us load the rod. So we want to move the line from down there up here. By doing this we create what is called a D loop. That the line is going from the rod tip down to the water in, in, and it looks a bit like this. 
This D loop is very important in terms of getting the right amount of load in the rod. If we make a very little D loop like here, it's difficult to make a good forward cast. Simply there's not enough power in the cast to do it. You have to use a lot of power to straighten the line. Whereas if I've moved my leader to up here, I have a lot of power in my cast and it's easy to stretch it without me having to use more force. So getting the leader up here and having an anchor point next to you is very important in an underhand or a spay cast. What's important to understand is we want the line to form like this type of form here. Where the leader touches the surface and then the line goes up. In order to do that we have to move the rod tip in the same pattern. So if we go back to the beginning here I have the fly rod close to the water surface. I raise very slowly. What I then do is I rotate the butt part of the section, accelerate to a stop, and then the line or the tip of the rod goes like this, backward. Then when I get to this point and I want the fly line to land or the, the leader to land on the water, I make a drift or I do a pendling with the rod. This takes out a bit of the power in the D-loop and sets the leader on the surface so that I can control where my anchor point is. Furthermore, it repositions the rod so that it's easy for me to do a good forward cast. The forward cast is the same as in the overhead cast. You accelerate to a stop and then the line moves forward. If we put this together into, in speed, it looks like this. Rod tip down. Slowly I raise the line, then I rotate the rod stop, pendle to place the leader on the water and then I may make my forward cast like this. Raising the line, rotating, pendling, accelerate to a stop and there you have it an underhand or a spay cast. The 180 degree rule applies to all fly casting, whether we're talking about overhead casting or underhand casting. It's a technique we use to be able to angle the line, or a technique, it's a physical reality, that if you want an optimal angling, you have to use a 180 degree rule principle, that the direction of your backward cast is directly opposite to the direction of your forward cast. We've gone to a, a large river where it's more easy for you to see why this principle is very important. When we're angling the fly cast, it's important that we use our body to help us circle the rod so that we change the direction of the line in our back cast. It looks like this. I start by raising my rod, then I change weight on my feet, rotating my torso, and by doing that, the rod moves in a circular motion. This brings the line behind you in a way so that it's optimized for throwing it in that angle that I want. I lift the line, rotate my body, do my backward cast, pendle, and do my forward cast.
If you want to try double-handed fly fishing and you want to buy some equipment that can suit many different conditions, I recommend you that you choose a fly rod, a double-handed fly rod that is about between 12 and 13 feet length and an 8 weight. The 8 weight is quite universal. You can use it many places in the world. You can use it in uh, smaller rivers and in larger rivers. Uh, so it's, it's an all-round type of fly rod. What you need to think about when you choose a rod is that when you start out fly fishing, the action of the fly rod is very important. Very fast tapered rods are not a good choice when you're starting to fish with double-handed fly rods. What you need is a rod that bends down in the rod, has a medium type of action. That means that it bends down in the rod, and it must be a progressive action, meaning that it bends the more you load the rod or the more weight you carry, so that it bends deeper and deeper depending on how much power you apply to the rod. There are many different rods on the market today that has this type of action. In fact, it's the most popular one. So it's, it's quite easy to find one of these rods that has this type of action. When you've chosen a rod that you like, and please try many different types of rods before you choose one, it's also time to put the rest of the gear together. And this is very important. The first thing you need is a fly reel. The drag system in a fly reel is very important, especially when we're talking about double-handed fly fishing where we are often targeting very big fish. It's important that you choose one that fits your rod. And there are two factors determining what type of reel you should choose. The first thing is that the weight of the fly reel helps balance your rod. This is a balanced setup where the reel matches the grip point on the rod and um, it balances perfectly as you can see. The second factor is that it needs to be able to hold the amount of line that you need. For instance, this reel here is what I use on my 8 weight. It can hold the amount of line that I need. I could also choose to have a big one like this which is very wide and uh, this one can have a lot of line on it. I use this for my larger uh, type of rod, so, or when I'm fishing in places where I really need backing if the fish would choose to run away and I can't follow. But when you're just starting to learn how to fly fish with double-handed rods, I recommend that you buy a floating fly line. It's easier to learn to cast with a floating fly line. I recommend that you buy a shooting head system because the shooting head system is a fixed weight that fits your rod. I also recommend that you buy a relatively short shooting head. A shooting head for a rod like this one, which is a 12.6 foot 8 weight, I would say around 8.5 to 9.5 meters of shooting head all in all. You connect your shooting head to a running line. It can be either a monofilament or a coated running line. I recommend the coated running line when you're starting them. It helps you to turn over the fly a bit better. It's, it's easier to handle. And for a setup like this with an 8 weight, 0.32 millimeter coated floating running line. I'm talking very much about short shooting heads. Well, what is a short shooting head? Well, a shooting head that is really short is anything from 6 meters to about 9.5 meters. I would call those really short shooting heads. If we go 9.5 to 11, 12 meters, I would say those are medium. And 13 to 20 meters, those are long. The last part of your equipment is your leader. When you choose a leader, we normally say that you have to have around 1.5 rod length of leader material all in all. But there's a system to this and it depends on fly size. Here I have two different sizes of flies. One is a bit bigger than the other. For this, which is a size 13 double hook, um, I would use almost double length of the fly rod in leader material. For this one I would use one and a half length of leader material. 
There are two different types of leaders you can choose. One is the monofilament leader, which is a tapered leader that weighs practically nothing. In the end of this type of leader, you can always tie in a tip if you want to lengthen the leader, if you need to, according to the size of fly you're fishing with. Secondly, you can also choose poly leaders. A poly leader is uh, a leader that has a coating and it has a bit more mass, a bit more weight to it. It helps you to create better angles when you are spay casting and it also it, it's a bit more stable when it flies through the air because it has a bit more mass. They come in different densities. It could be floating or sinking in various degrees. Uh, what I would recommend that you do is to choose an intermediate poly leader. In this case, it's an intermediate salmon poly leader. It fits my rod perfectly. It's 12 foot long, so almost as long as the rod. And then you can tie in a, a tip and lengthen your leader so it, it comes into the right length. When you're choosing to put on a tip, I would recommend when you start out that you have an 0.33 millimeter. It could be an island or it could also be a fluorocarbon. Uh, so an 0.33 millimeter and an 0.30. These two different diameters are very good and they can suit many different conditions. So the basic setup for a beginner is a 12.6 foot, eight weight double-handed fly rod, a fly reel that matches, can hold the amount of line that you need, balances the fly rod, and a short floating shooting head. An 0.32 millimeter running line, coded, and an intermediate poly leader, and two types of tips, an 0.33 and an 0.30 millimeter. When I'm fishing these types of rivers, and in many places really, I need good time in my cast to place my anchor. And to have good time in your cast, you need actions that work down deep in the rod. They are a bit more slow. But when you deliver the cast, you really want a cast or a rod type of action that straightens out quickly and recovers quickly. And that is, uh, a balance to find a rod that has a deep action that will help you to have good time in your cast but also get the speed uh, when it delivers. Some rods are really good at this but that is not the only action you can use. This rod I'm holding here is a 12 and a half foot six weight fly rod. It has a deep action but it also has a longer stroke so the the rod feels a bit slower. It, it, it doesn't deliver the same speed. When that is said, it's a really good tool to fish in waters where you are really restricted and you have to be able to place your anchor point very, very accurately. This is not a rod you use for long distance casting, but a rod you use for precision casting and fishing strategies where that is important or places where you really need time in your cast. This type of fly rod here has a deep action but it has a really sharp stroke. So it's really fast when it delivers the line and creates high line speed. And this is also a good tool to use when I have a bit more space around me. It still gives me time to place and anchor my fly line. But when it delivers, it delivers in high speed. So this will be better when I'm aiming for distance casting. Some people want long shooting heads. Some people want short shooting heads. And I would like to quote a very famous fly caster called Jørgen Andersen and say, well, if you have a short shooting head, you can cast anywhere. But if you have a long shooting head, you can't cast anywhere. There is a truth behind his words. I generally like shorter shooting heads because they're easy to cast and you can fish in almost any conditions. There are 
conditions though where you need longer shooting heads and that is if you really want to cast long distances because the long shooting head can roll longer. So if you really want to go for distance casting you need longer shooting heads. They can be all from 13 to 20 meters of length. You have to have a really good technique to cast these fly lines. I am a strong believer in the short shooting heads. As I said, it gives me the possibility to fish many places, whereas longer shooting heads can cause problems. Now I've fitted this rod with a fairly long shooting head. And when I'm trying to angle across the water, I put the line in behind me. And as you can see, I get caught up on the riverbank. I actually caught the roots here uh, just next to me. So the longer shooting heads, they make it more difficult for me to make steep angles that for instance if I want to go straight across, the line comes in behind me and it's very close to the vegetation here. And that eliminates power in the cast. There's one thing you can do though if you're fishing with long shooting heads and you want to still have a good angle and that is to bring the line up next to you then cast from there angle out twisting your body a bit that is one possibility of of casting with a longer shooting head you place it there and then you twist your body just a bit and bring it across bring the line up to your side twist your body and cast forward there is a better solution, and that is to use a short shooting head. Let me show you what that looks like. I've now changed to a shorter rod with a six and a half meter long shooting head. When I want to angle this line, it's much easier. I could put it in behind me, and I don't get caught up in the vegetation as easy. Let me show you again. I can do really, really steep angles and I'm far away from the veg vegetation. So the short shooting head makes it easy for me to fish places like this because I'm not restricted in how to angle. So I can use many different strategies when I'm fishing. Let me show you, for instance, like I did before with the long shooting head, I placed it here and then I twisted my body to get it out. When I do this, I will get a very fast presentation on the fly. But if I really want to get it down deep a bit, I'll let it sink, it's difficult to do it like that. But if I do a good angle, put the rod out, I now have plenty of time to get the fly down and control uh, the drift of the fly. So the shorter shooting heads makes it possible for me to use many different tactics, not just one. In terms of different fly lines or different shooting heads, I like fly lines that have different densities and I almost use sinking lines all of the time because I believe that the closer you get to the fish, the easier it is to actually catch it. But of course, choosing a fly line, if it's like right here, right now, it's very hot. I mean, the water is nearly 20 degrees and when you're fishing these conditions, floating lines can be really good floating lines, long, thin liters, and, and very small flies. It can be the way to go. But some places here we have very hard water, and fish can stand in very hard water because there's much more oxygen there. Um, when you're fishing hard water, you still need to get the fly down just below the white water. I fish sinking lines. And if there are really deep pools where the fish are standing and they won't go to the surface, you need sinking lines. So. I keep different lines with me all the time. 
Some of my favorite lines are these newer version of sync, sync tip lines. They could be, for instance, this one is a float sync three. I also have a float sync five and they come in different categories. What I like about these is that you have a floating back part of the line and you have a sinking tip. The floating line is very easy to maneuver to catch the different currents so you can fish the line very effectively and control it in the drift. So I like these type of lines. The only times where I'm using really sinking lines is if, it, is if I want to go down really deep. Then I, I choose sink 5 or sink 3, 4, sink 5, 7, those type of lines. I find those really, really good uh, because I can get down deep. But when I'm fishing sinking shooting heads, I keep them really short because they're much easier to control, they're much easier to cast. Sometimes it can be really effective to fish a sinking fly line. And new developments in fly line manufacturing have created some, some different lines that are very easy to use when you're fly fishing. On this setup, this is a six weight rod and I have a very short, um, it's about seven meters and it's floating sink three and then in the tip I have a super fast sinking poly leader. This creates a line that hangs perfectly down into the stream and in places like this where you're fishing small pockets you can get really close to the fish that are stuck to the bottom and it can be really effective. So the advantage of using these sinking lines is that you get closer to the fish of course the disadvantage is that they can be difficult to handle. These very short ones are quite easy because you can basically just do as you would normally do. You can lift them off the water because they're so short. And the back part of the shooting head is still floating. So I just do what I do normally when I'm underhand casting. I raise the line, twist, anchor and cast. It's really, really easy and very simple. If you're using really heavy sinking lines, they're not that easy to lift off because they're submerged in water and you have to bring them to the surface. And to do that, there is a simple and a bit more complicated strategy to use. The simple one is that you can do a roll cast down in your own side. By doing so, you lift the line up into the water surface and from there, you can cast and angle the line. It has a disadvantage and that is that when you roll down your own side you splash a lot and sometimes you spook fish. There is a more clever way to it. What you do is you bring the line in so that the shooting head is just like 10 centimeters out uh, from the, the top eye of the rod. Put your rod down horizontal and then you bring the rod tip back by pushing out the butt part of the rod and then you bring the rod into your own side like this. By doing so you put the line up in the air. You do like a sidewards cast and when the line is up in the air you just pick it up, anchor the line and cast again and then you're back to fishing. It's really a simple and effective way to, to bring up a sinking line when it's submerged in the, in the water. So when we're fishing it's important that we keep some sort of control of our running line we can do that by hanging it in loops. So I create a big loop to start out with and I hang that over my little finger. I then take and make a smaller loop and I put that over the next finger. So now I have two loops hanging inside each other and then when I do my cast I let them go. And because they have been coiled up in that system they almost never tangle. You do your cast, you stop the rod and you let it go. Of course this takes some adjustment so you have to practice this a bit 
it could seem hard in the beginning, but if you give it a couple of days where you do this when you're fishing, then it becomes a natural way of how you retrieve the line. In fly casting, we have two different approaches to fly casting when we're talking about double-handed and switch tactics. There is the traditional style of casting, which originated in Scotland uh, and has since moved across the Atlantic to America. The other type of casting or the other style is the Scandinavian style, which was developed in Sweden by Jörn Andersen back in the 80s. These two styles are very different but utilize some of the same principles in terms of um, acceleration and stops in the cast. How you move the rod is very different though. In the traditional style, you grip the rod more like a shotgun type of, of grip. You have the thumb on top on both handles and you move the rod mainly with your right hand. In this casting style, you use your right hand to move the rod and you move it forward in a way where you move both hands forward and then in the end of the casting stroke, you stretch out the arms and pull up the butt part of the rod and deliver the rod still up high so you get a relatively narrow loop. Moving forward snap. They call it a shotgun grip because it's almost like you're aiming with a shotgun. Rotate, snap. In the Scandinavian style it's different. You don't use the right arm to control the rod. The right arm is basically just a point where you hold the rod and all power application comes from the bottom hand. And that means that you use small movements close to your body where it's the bottom hand moving the rod. The idea behind this is that you generate high line speed and it's very comfortable when you're casting. You don't have to hold out the rod like this. You are close to your body. You have more control um, and it's easier to manipulate the line in the air. They are different casting styles. I prefer the Scandinavian style, but for some people it's very difficult because they have a really dominant right hand and they want to push the rod forward. And in that case, it can be all right that you utilize a traditional uh, style of casting. Both types can get the fly out then, and that's what it's all about, basically. Scandinavian style, move, cast close to your body, in the traditional style, I go straight up with the rod, come back, put the leader on the surface and go forward with my right hand. That is the real difference. When people start fishing in the river, some people, they're pointing their feet in the direction that they're walking. But this is a challenge because when you're fishing streams and rivers, we have to angle the line. And the way you position your body is crucial in this context. If you have your feet pointing downwards and you want to angle, your body will sort of lock when you get to this position here and it's difficult to turn and you're all off balance. So, a good idea when you're angling is to point your feet in the direction you want to cast. So if we want to cast in this direction, my right foot is pointing in that direction. I always have one foot in front of the other. In this case, when I'm casting with my right hand, I have my right foot forward. If I want a steep angle, I just turn my feet a bit more. 
This makes it easier for me to turn and angle the line. This is because it's easier then to put some body movement into the cast. So depending on how much you want to angle, you just move the line to the point you want to angle. So if you want to angle really across, you bring the line all the way up here. If you don't want to angle that steep, you just bring the line to your side. Now acceleration is very important in an underhand cast because what we create between the rod tip and the water surface is a D loop. The line comes in behind you and forms a D. Now in a D loop we have active and we have passive line. When I'm doing a roll cast for instance I have a very shallow D loop and it's really difficult to get power into my cast. If I want to do this roll cast, I really have to push it forward to get the line out of the water. And that is because I don't have very much line behind the rod. But if I make an underhand cast, I have much more line behind me and it's easier to cast and get power into the line. Let me show you. Raise, you do an acceleration and we stop, and it's easy to cast, and we have a lot of power and speed in the line. It's really important to get much active line into your D loop, and that means that you have to have very little line on the water and very much in the air between the rod tip and the water. If you can see here that. This one is very soft, so I get a very soft D-loop and not much power. If I add acceleration and stop, the line comes much further back. I get much more active line and much more power in my cast. And this is where many fly casters, they go wrong. They do not get enough acceleration into their backwards cast when they're underhand casting. I'm on a stretch of water where I'm very confined and restricted in my surroundings. I have a huge cliff right next to me here and trees behind me. I have only one option here and that is the underhand cast. Furthermore, there is a bit of vegetation on the bank that goes out into the water. And this can make um, creating the D-loop in behind me very difficult also because I have the trees. So here I'll also use a cast called a circle C cast, which gives me the possibility to fish this stretch of water quite efficiently. The whole idea behind the circle C cast is that I'm able to move my anchor point from in behind me and out over the water. If I was doing a normal underhand cast here, I would get this challenge that when I do my D loop, the line would tangle up in the trees. So this is not a good option. So instead I use the circle C cast to move my anchor point away from me out into the river. When you do the circle C cast, you hold your rod into your own bank and from there you form a circle moving clockwise. When you form this circle, you start slow and fast. By doing this motion, you pick up the line, throw it in a circle and the leader will land away from you out in the river. 
from there, you just basically do your normal underhand cast. So, if I put it together in a bit of speed, I do the circular motion clockwise, moving the leader, and then ending up in my regular underhand cast. The circle C cast can be a difficult cast to learn, but there are some steps you can do that will make it easier. The difficult part in this cast is to combine the circular motion with the underhand cast motion. But if you separate those two, you get a more easy uh, learning process. You start with the circular motion clockwise, bringing the rod tip into your own bank. From there, you move into the underhand cast motion and do your underhand cast from there. So you add a break in the middle of your cast. This will make the cast splash a bit more, but it's easier to learn like this. When you have practiced that, you can put it up in speed. And it goes like this. You do the circle. While it's in the air, you move the rod, and you do your underhand cast motion from there. This will create less splashing on the water. The rest of this beat down here, I'll use combinations between circle C casts and regular underhand casts. I always choose a cast that matches the conditions most optimally. This place is a real challenge. I have trees hanging out over the water on the other side. I have trees and bushes behind me and also hanging out over the water on my own side. This place is very narrow and very deep and the current is really interesting. This is a good place for salmon. Normally I would fish a sinking line here because it's deep and I have to get the fly down. But to give you a more visual effect, I've put on a floating line. When you have to fish in these conditions and you have to get in underneath branches on the other side, I always sit down because the exit height of my line will be lower than if I'm standing. So to manage this situation, I get down on my knees. What I do here is that I do a normal underhand cast, so to speak. I raise the line, I do my back cast, but when I get to the back cast, instead of doing a vertical movement forward, I put the rod down on the side. When I put the rod down on the side, the loop will come out sideways and it will shoot in under the branches on the other side. It looks like this. I start by raising the line, do my back cast. When I get to this place here, I put the rod down on the side so that the line will go down on the side and shoot in under the branches on the other side. If I put it together in speed, it will look like this.
tracing the line, shooting it sideways, getting in under the branch, and start fishing. Many times people will walk past this place because it is too difficult, but there are loads of good opportunities to catch fish in these places. So if you want a good adventure, this is a good place to get it. In a forest river like this, we encounter trees. And this is a place where the switch rods come in really handy. The switch rods can be used as single-handed rods. And they're a bit shorter than the double-handed rods. Therefore, it's easier to fish under the trees. When you really get in under the trees, of course, if your rod is sticking up, you'll hit the trees. But what you can do here is that you can put the rod down on its side so that you do a sideways cast, more or less. What you do is you raise like you normally would, but you keep the rod low at all times. I splash a lot in the water, so there's something that's very important that you do here. And that is when you make your, your backwards cast, you go low and up. Because then you make a better anchor up here. So you kind of sweep and go up a bit. So sweep alongside here and up. And then it's possible to, to cast here. By doing this, it's actually possible to fish very close to the water like this, and you could get out under the trees and reach those places in the river where you actually find fish. On very narrow rivers, I like to fish the deeper parts. I normally do this with sinking lines to get the fly down, but in this case I'm using a floating line so that you can see what is happening. This narrow part has a very strong current on the outside and a very slow moving current on the inside. That means that when I'm trying to get my fly across and I want it to go down, it will be swept away by the current. So I have to use one of two tactics. Either I do a reach cast or I change my angle a bit so that it's a bit more downstream and then drop the line. I'd like you to show you the reach cast right now. When I'm making a reach cast, in this case I have plenty of room so I can do an overhead cast. The reach cast is a motion I do with the rod after I stop it on the forward cast. It looks like this. I raise the line, angle it in the air, cast forward, and then I put my rod out and back in. So I move the rod tip out into the stream and back in. This creates an upstream mend that will allow the fly to sink, and then the line straightens out, and when it straightens out, it comes across in a good way. If I put it together in speed, it looks like this. I raise the line, angle the cast, stop, reach, and move in again. Now the fly is sinking, the current is taking the line, and now it starts to move, and then it comes across. This is a very effective way of fishing these parts of the river. This is a place where we fish for sea trout and salmon. As you can see, it's quite narrow. 
and we've got lots of different streams and pools and these are the places where we're fishing down here to fish these smaller streams efficiently I always choose light switch rods I see the switch system as a system where you have rods that are basically small double-handed rods they can also be used as single-handed rods the specific rod I'm holding right now is a 10.6 foot class 4 switch rod this is classified as a double-handed rod that means that it goes with about 14 grams that would be equivalent of a class 6 single-handed rod this type of equipment gives me the benefit of a bit longer rod and also that I can use it casting with two hands when I fish these small rivers I normally most of the time I normally use a floating line but what I do is I have different types of leaders that I put in front so that I can change the depth of the fly the reason why I use floating lines is because some of these parts of this river is perfect for hitching and other parts you need to get down in in deeper sections so I need to be able to change my tactics when I move along down the stream and this setup makes that possible behind me you see a stretch of water where I have trees in my back the only option for me here is to underhand cast furthermore the stream is we have a very heavy or fast flowing stream on the outer side of of the river here and it's quite calm in my own side this means that I have to come across and then come down a bit because we have the deeper part over there and then go across and come into my own side when I fish a stretch of river like this I make my underhand cast go to the other side I hold the rod high and then let go this makes the fly come down and then when it moves across I use the length of my rod to maneuver the fly to get it across first of all I make my underhand cast I let go to get the fly down then I wanted to sweep across so I hold the rod tip into my own bank and when the fly line comes in I hold it out to the other side this makes the fly come all the way into my own side and from there I start to strip this is a wide river it's very open and very windy the place I'm fishing is an inside curve which means that I have the deep part of the stream on my own bank and the more shallow part on the other side in this side the fish will be lying right under my feet so to speak so I have to fish the line into my own side so I have to cast across I have to angle the line I have to let it come down sink a bit and then sweep across into my own side and when it gets into my own side I let it hang for a bit just to get the fly moving and then I start stripping from here I raise the line angle the line cast forward give the fly time to sink and then I hold my rod on the inside of the curve to make the stream catch the line and move it all the way into my own bank when it starts to slow down I hold the rod out and I allow the fly to come in from there I start stripping this is an effective way of fishing the inside curve There are some key elements to becoming a successful fly fisher. One of the most important things is that you're able to cast under almost any circumstance. 
Now right here I have a heavy wind coming in from the west, meaning that if I was, I was standing on the other bank, the wind would blow the line into me, so it would be difficult for me to cast. But if I go to the other side, I get a very beneficial wind coming in from the side, which will help me cast across. What I have to do here is to put the rod in my left hand, so I have left hand on top. This can be difficult if you are really right-handed, but if you master this, casting with your left hand on top, you can access so much water which you would normally pass by. When you have to cast with left hand on top, what is difficult is that you're using a hand that is not your dominant hand. And many people think they have to use the top hand to move the rod. But what will really help you out here is if you imagine that your left hand is just holding the rod. It's not moving the rod, it's just holding it. And that your right hand, which is your dominant hand, is the one that is moving the fly line and the fly rod. If you can get that concept into your head then and into your body as well, then this becomes more easy because you're actually using your most dominant hand to do the cast. And it looks like this. When you want to learn to cast with your left hand on top, there are some things you can do that will help you out. First of all, it's very important that you place your feet in the direction you want to cast. And I put left foot forward because I'm using left hand on top, right foot behind of me. When I have to raise the line here, what I do is that I use the body to help me and the left hand is just holding the rod, it's not moving it. So I use the body to lift it and then I circle with the underhand and I cast. I don't move left hand at all, it's just holding the rod. So the key to becoming a good left-handed fly caster is just to hold the rod with your left hand but move it with your right hand and use the body at the same time. Then it becomes more easy to do a left-handed cast. Gadget casting has become very popular and with many good reasons. A skagit cast was invented in the Pacific Northwest of America where they had to throw big flies and heavy sinking lines to get the fly down to the fish there. What they invented was a system, a sink tip system really, where you have a really heavy and thick uh, non-tapered belly and in front of that you add a tip, a sinking tip, and then a short monofilament leader and a big fly. What they then did was that they used this system to of course get down into the different deep areas of the currents, but they also cast it in a very specific way. What separates Skagit casting from traditional spay is the fact that you use short shooting heads and you always work on some sort of sustained anchor. Whereas a, a traditional spay cast in many areas is an airborne anchor. Now, a sustained anchor is when you put the leader and the tip of your fly line on the water. When it lies there, it sinks down, and then you move it from there where the leader is still in the water. That is a sustained anchor. The airborne anchor is when you lift it off, go back, set it on the water, and so that you lift the line off the water during your casting motion. So Skagit always uses a form of a sustained anchor. Put it in the water, move, and cast from there. The way you do a Skagit cast is the same way as you would do a Circle C cast. You hold the rod tip into your own bank 
and then you create a circle starting slow ending fast and then put the rod tip into your own bank that brings the leader out into the water from there you have good time to reposition your cast in the direction you want to go where you just do the similar motion as you would do in an underhand cast if I do this in full speed I do the circular motion bringing the rod tip round and into my own side move the anchor and cast because the fly line is relatively untapered it will lift the sinking tip really easily and moving the big fly away from you this is of course very handy when you're fishing with big flies it's also very easy because you have like a stop position there where you have good time to reposition your cast before you cast forward you get it away from the bank and in that context it's a perfect cast for a situation like this however there is also a disadvantage the disadvantage is that you splash an awfully lot if you take a look at the water in front of me I do the circle sustain the anchor and now I move it take a look at how much I splash in the water that is in some instances not a good idea especially when you're fishing a river like this that is quite calm but if you have very heavy current then it's no problem so the place where you're fishing will dictate how well a Skagit system will suit that situation but it's a very effective way to cast Sometimes when we're fishing for salmon in the early season, we use rather big and heavy flies. This is not the biggest or the heaviest, but still a big and heavy fly. It's got an aluminium tube and a, a long sunker strip wing, which will get very heavy and wet. To cast big flies, the Skagit system is perfect because it has a short leader. This is basic monofilament leader. And then you have a sinking tip. These, these are called T-tips. A sinking tip will get your fly down but will be relatively easy to, to get off the water because it's not an entirely sinking line. In the end of your T-tip there is a floating line and this is rarely untapered so it's, it's really heavy and thick in the end where it connects to the T-tip. The reason for this is that this will enable this line to pick up the sinking line and turn it over. There's a lot of energy in a thick line, so it's just to distribute power out through the line. This gadget head is, uh, uh, weighs 31 grams. It is for a 9 weight fly rod. And this is what I would normally use if I was to take a shooting head, I would choose one 31-32 grams. So the Skagit head matches the normal head weight that I would choose. The T-tip adds weight because this is a piece of fly line. So this will add to the weight of your total fly line. So the Skagit system will, if you put both heads on the weight, weigh a bit more than your traditional type of lines. But that is part of the efficiency of them, that they can load the rod deeply and carry out big flies. This is my favorite sea trout river. The river is quite narrow, but we get really big sea trout going up here. The biggest sea trout weigh around 8, 9, 10, even 11 and 12 kilos. When we're fishing for these big sea trout at night, we use rather big, dark flies. They have to be dark and big so that they can see them, but also have some contrast. 
To cast these big flies, these switch rods are really great. I can use a class 4 or a class 5 switch rod to fish these. I just have to shorten my leader, so I have about a rod length of leader material all in all. The tip of my leader must be really heavy, 0.35 millimeter, because then I have a really stiff leader that can turn over the big fly. Another advantage of the switch rods on rivers like these is that a switch rod is longer than, in, than a single-handed rod. So I can stay in here, away from the brink, on the bank here, away from the water. That means that I'll be less visible to the fish. Still, I'll be visible, you know, it's night time, there's moonlight and stuff, so they can still see me, but if I stand in here, I'm more hidden than if I stand right on the brink. So I have my rod tip lying just over the water at the point where the water meets the brink. When fishing these big flies, your fly casting becomes a part of your fishing strategy. I have to get the fly across to the other bank, as close to the other bank as possible, and then I have to bring it across the river in high speed. That means that I have to have a very sharp angle on the water. I use my switch rod as a single-handed rod in this situation. And I have to remember the 180 degree rule that direction backwards is the same as direction forward. So I bring the rod around, I raise the line, bring the rod around, stop, cast, and then I stop in my front stop and put the rod tip down close to the ground. By doing this, I manipulate the angle of the line so that I get a more steep angle on the water. And then I use the length of the rod. By raising the rod tip, I can bring up speed on the fly. It looks like this. So I raise the line, circle the rod, stop, stop, and then put the rod down. Then. I raise the rod. By doing this, the fly will come out sweeping across with huge speed. And this is very effective if I'm fishing for sea trout that are lying on the other bank. So, circle, stop, bring your rod down, raise the line. You can combine this with a slow stripping of the line. This will again increase the speed. The conditions on this river is it's very hot and it's summer and the water temperature is very close to 20 degrees. So when that happens, I, I tend to find places where there's lots of oxygen in the water. There is some really white water and a very rapid stream downstream. And then there is this small pocket before it gets into a really slow and deep pool. When they come over here, they stop in these small pockets here. And this is a very difficult place to, to cast really because there's not much space. But luckily, I don't have to cast great distances. I just have to get the fly across to the current and fish the small pockets here where the fish might be resting. What I do here is that the short shooting head is very important and again I choose a rod with a more deep and slow action because it gives me time. I hold the rod very close to my body and I don't move it much, I don't accelerate that much. I just move the line so it comes right next to me because I have trees here and I don't want to get caught in those. So this is really delicate fishing. So what I do is that I make these short casts and then I lengthen the line a bit because there are some different pockets out here that I want to fish. Raise the line slowly, anchor the line and then cast forward. I have to use a bit more force in my uh, forward cast, but that is simply because I don't have a very uh, steep D-loop. Uh, it's, it's very shallow, so to speak. So one more time, lift up, anchor, shoot the line. 
So it is possible to fish these different places. You just have to adjust your gear and your casting technique. I have rocks placed different places around me and also trees in behind me. So this is a difficult place to fly cast. The rocks make it even more difficult because I have to make sure that my line does not catch these rocks. If the fly hits the rocks, then the hook can break off or it can become unsharpened. I've got a big rock out there that if I make a regular underhand cast, that would be where my line and my leader would land. So I can't do that. I have to do something else. So what I do is I bring the rod around in a roll cast. It could be in different kinds of angles so that I can bring the line up in the air. When I bring the line up in the air I can control where to put it. So if I make this is a wrong shoulder roll cast the line is up in the air and then I can bring it in close to myself. I could also make like a roll cast in my own side on the right hand side where it's like a horizontal roll cast more or less because again it brings the line up in the air and it gives me time to place and anchor the leader. So I have to use these different tactics if I want to ca cast around these obstacles. What is difficult about that is I still want the steep angle so that I can get the fly to come across rapidly. And furthermore, I'm fishing a sinking line here uh, because it's rather deep in, in the other side where I'm fishing. So this is what you have to practice. Roll casts that bring the line up in the air and from there you apply acceleration much acceleration if you want it up here and less acceleration if you want it down here. This is one way of doing it. You can also use circles. For instance you can do a circle clockwise that brings the fly and the leader away from the rocks. It's one and a good way to do it really. Um, you can also use uh, circles that are in the air because basically this is what it's all about getting the fly up in the air so that you can control the anchor point. So a circle up here will still place the anchor here in front of me. So you've got these two possibilities roll casting techniques or circle techniques. On some locations, distance can mean the difference. But distance casting requires a very specific technique. Now, when I started looking into fly casting, there were the most well known fly caster in Scandinavia was Jorn Andersen. And then Henrik Mortensen came along. And then in Norway, I found um, two twins called uh, Knut and Trond Sjöstad and uh, they were competition casters and fly fishermen in Auckland, Norway and they have developed sort of a hybrid between the underhand cast technique and the more traditional style where you also use the right hand. What they do is that the hands and the arms are close together always, they follow each other, it's almost like they're locked in together. This gives you the possibility of getting very much power in your cast because you can use power from both the bottom hand and also the upper hand when you're casting. They still remain with a high stop to give the line long fall time. That is essential when you are uh, going for the distance. 
Now, one thing is very important here, and that is power or speed. When you do your back cast in the spay cast, you have to get as much acceleration into it as possible. The reason why you need all that acceleration is to make a really active D-loop. So the more acceleration you can put in, the better. There is a critical point, however. If you put too much acceleration in, the line goes into an overhead cast, more or less. So it's a crucial point. You have to get right to the limit to get the maximum amount of speed on your backward cast. Then, when you do your forward cast, you use both hands. When you do the cast and let the line go. And again here, acceleration and stop is key. To generate as much power as possible, you have to use the body. You have to, when you do the backward cast, you go, you lean back on your back foot, in this case my left foot, and my right foot, when I do the forward cast, I lean into the cast. This movement becomes really important when you go for distance casting. Let me show you how that works. So when I pick up the line, I have all my weight on my front foot. And I pick up the line and I move my weight to the back foot when I do my backward cast. And then when I'm back here and I do my forward cast, I put the weight back on the front foot. So if I put it together in speed, it looks like this. I raise back on the backward foot and weight onto the front foot again. By doing this, you get as much power into the cast as possible because you use every muscle in your body to generate power. And that is really essential. Furthermore, when you're distance fly casting, I use a rod that is specifically designed for this. It has a deep action, but still a very powerful stroke and a fast recovery. Furthermore, I use a long a shooting head, the one I'm casting here is 13 meters long, and this is a 13 foot rod. And then I use a monofilament running line or shooting line simply to slow down the roll in the line when I'm doing a distance cast. <laughs> 